Thank you. Hello, can you guys, can I, okay, this is working, excellent. Good morning, thank you all for coming back to the, uh, the morning after the party session, first session. Um, I'll start you off kind of slow. So as Dan mentioned, I'm Patty Toland. I'm one of the partners and one of the founders at Filament Group. We are a tiny uh, design and front end coding firm in Boston. And we like to focus a lot on progressive enhancement and responsive design. But our bigger real agenda is to make sure that we make a web that works for everyone. And um, I wanna start by thanking Matthias and everyone who runs this conference, not just because it is so spectacular, the talks have been great, but also because uh, when he invited me to speak, it was a really nice opportunity for me to step back and think about what we do and what, is, what we've learned as we do it and what we've come up with that we think is important. And one of the things that I discovered was that uh, actually two weeks from today is the fourth anniversary of the launch of our very first responsive site. And that site was the bostonglobe.com site. Um, it was actually um, kind of surprisingly famous when it, when it launched because it was one of the very first large scale responsive sites in the States. And uh, it was a point where uh, the concept of responsive was not even a year old when it launched. And um, a lot of people were skeptical about whether responsive could really work. And so people said it was gonna be fine for little portfolio sites, not too complicated things, but responsive didn't really have a future for real websites. And uh, we were very lucky to be on a team that worked on this and kind of proved a lot of the skeptics wrong. Um, it was a unique time because there weren't very many models to work with. And so a lot of it was pioneering. We were making things up as we went along. Uh, but we learned a lot. Uh, in the four years since then, uh, we at Filament have been very lucky to work on about 35 different responsive sites, a couple of new sites. We've worked on more complex sites. This is an apartment rental site, things with complex functionality self-checkouts, e-commerce. We worked on intensive data, you know, data complex sites. We worked on some tight sites and tools for medical and uh, informatics research. We've worked on a big, a wide range of fairly complex interfaces and sites. And we also sort of, during that whole time, we also were the designers and front-end developers for the jQuery mobile framework. And so as we worked on all those different projects and a bunch of others, this is just a representative set, uh, we started to see some interesting patterns in the way responsive can work and some interesting principles for how to implement and how to work with teams. And in all these projects, we're very small. We're only six people. And we do uh, visual design and front end code. And so we fit into bigger teams. And so sometimes we'll work with a team where it's a startup and they have a technology team and we are their design team. So we just do the, all the work and we'll do every template and we'll work with them. For other clients, we'll actually work as a small part of their internal design team. And so we're doing a lot more mentoring and we'll come up with a set of representative templates that get at the ideas of how a system will work and then their team needs to take them and extend them. And so some of the things that we've found is one of the biggest challenges, especially for more complex systems, is how to create a design system for responsive that all the, people, all the members of our client teams can work with and understand and own and then build on and extend. And one of the things that is always interesting to us is when we come into a project, we think that you know, the designers and the front end developers are the people who need to understand. But the thing that has become really important to us is to know that the most important uh, constituents for us, most important audiences for our design projects are the business owners, the brand owners, and especially QA teams. That is the hardest place for, for responsive to work well. And so we started to work with, a, to sort of build a, a set of tools that will address those audiences because they have expectations and they're setting direction and they really need to understand the challenges of responsive so they can make responsible decisions well. So one of the first things that we learned over and over again as we met with teams was that a lot of the common design system resources that the, you know, the logos and color palettes and grids and specifications, so things like this, a 12 column grid, these kinds of specifications, toolkits like this, they, they set a direction, but they have some underlying assumptions that devices are sort of uniform and sort of predictable that aren't necessarily true. I think one of the reasons that people still sort of relied on those tools is they were thinking about this universe when they were thinking of responses. So they were thinking, we've got iPads and we've got iPhones. And that's actually still a fairly predictable and controllable universe. So we've got just a couple of screen sizes, we've got a couple of resolutions, not, it's, it's not 
the web. It's not the standard 1024, but it's still manageable. And even in 2014, when Apple introduced a couple of other devices, still pretty manageable, still a set of parameters that you can work with. Uh, and especially for the brand teams, this was something they were like, okay, we got this is gonna be complicated, but we'll figure out our grids. And so what we had started doing at the beginning of every project is just start with a reality check because I think the most successful projects work when everyone has a shared understanding and shared assumptions about how the world really works. If you all have that unified vision, then you know where you can go. So we start almost every project with this. So this is the universe. This is just Samsung's devices in 2014. Um, if any of you were at Florian and Adrian's presentation yesterday, they mentioned a, an organization called OpenSignal. OpenSignal does a lot of data about the Android universe. So this is the Android fragmentation for 2012 and 2013 and 2014 and 2015. And this is just the top 100 most popular devices, not all devices. So this is the universe that we are trying to design for. And this is the extended universe that we're trying to design for. We have wearables, we have e-readers, we have web-enabled television, we have devices embedded in refrigerators. There's a big universe of devices that you might not be thinking of as you're targeting, but somebody might want to access your content on. So we, uh, we actually are in a really privileged place where we actually have a device lab of about 150 devices, which is completely unreasonable. No one should have to do that. But, <laughs> but we like to make sure that we have at least a representative range of devices that we test on just to see what's going to happen. And as we've done that, we've determined that a specification like this, if a brand team is coming to you with this, the expectation that you're gonna have an identical match for even this universe, which is the most popular devices, you're just gonna have places where things are not going to fit. And to come up with a grid system for every point in that continuum is insanity, right? It's just a crazy, crazy challenge. So what we wanna do is we wanna understand like, and as we think about this for these brand teams, we like to sort of set their expectations of what's at stake, right? 67% of mobile users say that when they visit a mobile friendly site, they're more likely to buy a product or to engage with a service. And half of people say that if a site doesn't work well, they think the company doesn't care about them. You know, Eric's whole talk yesterday about trust, this is an erosion of trust if you're not thinking about people and meeting them where they are. So we want to come up with a set of systems, tools that will work. Our common tools are really too rigid and they assume control that's just not realistic. So we want new tools and techniques. And to get to those new tools and techniques, we need to start with a new mental model about what does design consistency even is and what it means. So over the years, we've started thinking, so like, what is design consistency for responsive? When I was starting to think about that, I went back to two of my design heroes. For anyone who doesn't know these people, this is Ray and Charles Eames. And they were, they're probably most famous for designing furniture for Herman Miller. But they were really big design thinkers. They did, they did architecture, they made films, they thought about scale, and they thought about materials, and they thought about complexity. And they have a wonderful definition for what design is, right? Design is about a, a plan for arranging elements to accomplish a particular purpose. Like that is a really liberating moment to stop worrying about the really fine grained things and just say like, we're arranging things to accomplish a purpose. And they actually went a step further and they said that the keys to an effective design is the ability of the designer to recognize as many constraints as possible and to be willing, the willingness and enthusiasm for working within those constraints. So they're not, you need to sort of approach it where this isn't about pixels. Our consistency is gonna be about understanding our purpose. And we need to be willing and enthusiastic to embrace our constraints. So when we come at a new design system, this is not the ugly thing that we need to work against. This is our opportunity. And so is this. These are our opportunities. And then there are a lot of ambient opportunities that we also need to keep in our heads. In addition to the screen sizes and form factors, we need to think about all the inputs and directions. We need to think about mouse and keyboard and keypad and scroll wheel and directional keys and tap and multi-touch and voice. And we need to think about bandwidth and network speeds. All of those factors need to be our opportunity. They need to be the things that we have in our head at all times. And uh, one of the things that I think we always also need to keep in mind is that it's really hard to predict where and when and how our traffic is gonna show up. And we had a really good object lesson on the first day that the Boston Globe launched. We put up the site and almost immediately someone tweeted, 
this. This is the bostonglobe.com site on the day it launched on a 13-year-old Apple Newton with a, with a jacked browser that somebody created on their own. There wasn't even a browser on that device. And this is an interesting moment for us because from the brand team's perspective, this did not meet any of their requirements, right? The logo wasn't the right size, the images weren't showing up, but from the organization's goal perspective, this was an enormous success. The news was there and it worked. The links linked to the articles. People were able to find out the weather. You know, it was really, so and from our, this was a, a great moment for us to say, oh, this is cool. We have a different definition, our client, came to us with a different definition of success along with us for this. And then two years later, this happened. Uh, somebody with a very, very new beta version of Google Glass was opening up websites on different browsers and, and posting screenshots. And we did not test on Google Glass because it was two years before it was even on anyone's spectrum, but it worked pretty well. We, ma we made some interesting discoveries about uh, fixed position footer elements <laughs> and decided to make changes based on this moment. But for the most part, the news worked, the layouts worked, the images worked, all the functionality worked. People could actually uh, sign up for a subscription on Google Glass. So that for us was, a re again, a really interesting validation of a lot of the important principles that we and our, and our client especially were willing to build into the process. So that, but that moment was the moment where we said, oh, okay, so responsive design needs to support the full spectrum of experiences, even the ones that haven't been invented yet. And so when we're thinking about responsive, we want to be preparing for that. So we, we need a mental model that accommodates that real and complicated world. And so this is, for anyone who saw Laura's presentation yesterday, uh, this is the second time you'll see this, this idea. This is Abraham Maslow. He is a psychologist. He worked in the 1950s. And he came up with this model, the Maslow's hierarchy of need. Uh, and so the basic principle here is that great achievements are possible only with a stable foundation in place. And this idea was, again, sort of when we were thinking about responsive, a really important principle that we have developed to work with our clients. And one of the things that we noticed is what, when people are talking about responsive and came to us, the really important principles they were thinking about were the scale, like things like grids and breakpoints and things like that, and the style. How are the logos and the type, uh, type sizes and things like that, that going to work? But as we have implemented you know, 35 responsive projects, we have come very strongly to believe that there are two very important aspects to this pyramid that you need to be thinking about before you start thinking about that. The first one is speed, and the second is access. And so my presentation today is really just going to be about some examples and some tools that we present to our clients when we're starting a project to help them understand how we can accomplish these goals. So I'm just gonna go through them bottom up. Um, so I know we've talked about, everybody talks about speed and performance and things like that, but this is something I think that has become so crucial to us in every part of our discussion around responsive. And so we, we wanna make sure people understand before we start any of the discussions about design that responsive is more than just fitting stuff on screens. Uh, I don't know if you all keep track of, <laughs> of the common statistic for the web, but as of August 1st of this month, the average web page is more than two megabytes in weight and 102 requests. Now for some mobile devices, that's a big challenge. Uh, global network speeds vary very widely. I think a lot of developers develop on very capable machines using 4G connections, or actually they're tied into a, a, a even better, like a T1 system. Um, the green there is 4G, the purple is 3G, the blue is 2G. This is last year. And this is sort of a best case scenario, right? Your, your network, this is the most ambitious definition of your network is, is gonna be, you might have 4G, right? Um, but the reality is that more people access Facebook over 2G than 4G, and your site is gonna have the same challenge. So we wanna make sure, and to compound it even more, online shoppers expect and want their pages to load in two seconds or fewer. And if they have to wait three seconds, many will abandon the site. Uh, Google has done some fantastic research and they've determined that people will make a decision about a competitor based on a quarter of a second difference in speed. And they've also, you know, all of these companies, there's a ton of data. Um, my slides I will tweet at the end of this and all of these links are available so you can, you know, dive into that. And so I won't get into this too much, but 
the, the speed has such real implications. You know, Google has determined that a, a half a second change in page load speed, they'll get 25% fewer searches. A quarter of their uh, traffic will change. Um, GQ magazine just did a uh, responsive update uh, last month, or actually month of June. Uh, so from June to July, they, they changed their page load, page load speed time from seven seconds to just under two seconds. And they saw that their, the number of visitors in one month went from six million to 11 million, and time on site change, went up by 30, 32%. So these, these are really tangible examples of how page speed can really change the engagement. And when we talk to clients about responsive, this is always gonna be the place where we start. For anyone who's not familiar with web page test, this again is a fantastic, has anybody, who here has used web page test? Yeah, this, so this is a tool, it is, uh, it's on the web, open, open and available to everyone. It actually connects to real devices on real network speeds and you can formulate a network speed and test your device and it will actually show you a timeline that shows you how long it takes your web, your web page to load. You can look at it at a tenth of a second so you can get really fine grained. So what we usually do when we start a project again is open a client's web page and look at how long it takes. We'll look on, on a desktop using Chrome on a, on a fast speed and if you're around two seconds, that's great. But one of the things that we've seen is that if you're on a mobile device on 3G, load speeds are usually two and a half to four times longer than they are on a desktop. So if you're loading your page at four, if, you know, two seconds on your desktop, it's probably taking somewhere between six and eight seconds on many mobile devices. So that two, that two second benchmark, if you're only holding yourself to that two second benchmark on a laptop, on cable, you're definitely missing some opportunities for many people on mobile devices. So, you know, New York Times, kind of interesting. Their, their web page on, on a desktop is really fast. Two and a half seconds to get the first paint, you get some content. About seven and a half seconds to get everything, including ads. When you open it on an Android on a 3G, it takes four and a half seconds of white, you get a white screen for four and a half seconds. Twelve and a half seconds before you get the content. And 30 seconds before the network, the ad network kicks in. So those kinds of things, your, your own content, third party tools, they come in in stages, but those stages can take a really long time. And I just looked at the, um, one of the Swiss newspapers to see, and it, it's about the same. So two, and, two to three seconds for desktop, five, six, five to 13 seconds before you get all your content. Um, this, I think, is a really useful tool for your clients, for your development teams, for them to start thinking about what their goals are. And what we want to always do is make sure that speed and performance, it's so critical that we build it into the design system. It's a design choice. Every design choice you make has speed and performance implications. And every design choice we make, we're going to think about through that filter. Because if your site doesn't show up in three seconds, it doesn't matter how beautiful it is, because many people aren't going to stay around for it. So we make speed part of the design process. We set performance goals in the design spec. Uh, we have actually worked with front end and back end teams. There's, you can actually take web page test and plug it into your build and break the build if it goes over a certain amount of time to load a page. So it can actually become a really nice automated tool. Uh, and some of the speed challenges that, we, that are really sort of front and center are things like images and video and audio, custom fonts, third party tools are always a, a challenge in terms of speed. Uh, code frameworks sometimes have scale that can be bigger than you necessarily need. Uh, and sort of just, you're always looking at like the data network needs to be a part of the factor as well. So whenever we're looking at any, uh, any bit of content and any design decision, we start by saying, is it necessary? Uh, if it is, is it necessary for everyone? Because we can use feature tests to only deliver it to devices that need it. And so we can at least have a, the most pared down version of a site for the, the least capable devices. Um, and then the third question is, is it necessary immediately? Because lazy loading can be your friend. So getting something that is usable to the user as quickly as possible and then adding features on as they become available is actually a nice technique. But we always wanna just take a critical eye to everything and pare down to the most essential and then optimize. And optimizing takes a lot of different, um, diff lot of different uh, characters. It can be uh, optimizing the size, compressing your images. It can be you know, obviously compressing your code. It can be scaling down the size of video. We wanna make sure that um, you render something useful as quickly as possible. So that's a part of our discussion as well. Um, one of the things that we do is we actually write, we release a lot of our techniques and our plugins open source. And we write a lot about the techniques that we use that we find helpful. So 
Uh, there's lots of links in this presentation, and you're welcome to use any of them. Um, and for any of you who don't know it, my colleague, Scott Gell, is really uh, a huge advocate of uh, responsible, responsive design. And he has developed some wonderful techniques and, tw and tools to think about how to get pages to load quickly. He, uh, this book is about four months old on a book apart. It's a fantastic, fast read. And then there's you know, whole conferences just about image optimization. So there are lots of techniques and tools in a very active community around images in particular. And so that's definitely worth looking at because images are probably anywhere between 50 and 80% of most page weight. So it's worth thinking about that. Uh, so once we have performance, at least the performance goals in our head, then our next discussion is really around access. So again, when we start projects, people, our clients will almost always come in and say like, all right, how are we gonna, what device targeting uh, tool are we gonna use and what JavaScript frameworks do you recommend? And one of the things that we start with is uh, that conversation about maybe none, right? Um, there are a lot of uh, devices that either don't support JavaScript or might not always load, no, load correctly. And what we say is we don't want to put that like front door where we prevent people from getting to our content. Um, we, we hear a lot from developers especially that they don't believe that the no JavaScript experience is really true. They don't think that anyone really, really disables JavaScript, that it's really an edge case. It's maybe 1 or 2%. Um, there is a large research organization in the US, the Pew Research Institute, that does a lot of research on internet behaviors. And they released a report last year where they said they did a survey of 5,000 people. 15% of that audience had devices that were not, that did not have, either did not have JavaScript capabilities at all or JavaScript is not enabled. And that was just a random sample of, of the US population. Uh, they actually went out of their way to find people who were, uh, who were older and younger and also people from all socioeconomic groups. So this for us is, if you think that, that the, Java, the no JavaScript universe is not true. I think this is really an interesting data point for us that that's not really the case. So we want to make sure that we accommodate everyone and that we're inclusive. And we really think there's no, there's no good reason to limit access to your basic content at least. We want to make sure that everyone gets something, something that's appropriate. So we, also, we are huge advocates of progressive enhancement. Uh, we really think that it's, it, it's critical to ensure broad access and also to be fault tolerant. Even if you have JavaScript enabled, if it doesn't load correctly, the, you're putting your, your site at risk and your, and your uh, visitors are going to be challenged. Um, for those, uh, uh, does everyone know about progressive enhancement, what it is and what it means? Yeah. So yeah, it's just starting with semantic markup. When you add features, you add them based on capabilities and you layer them in over. Uh, and when you're thinking about progressive enhancement, we talk to people and they have a perception that it's going to be all or nothing. That you have, if you're starting with native, it has to be the dumbest version of native. And that's, I think, the opposite of the truth for us. It's really just thinking differently about your content and your source order and your structure and interaction in a way that starts with something that's the simplest version and then builds up without breaking. And we've actually done a couple of, this is sort of a range of examples from sites that we've done. This one, you might not even see the immediate difference, but um, this client, Lego, really wanted to, they have a rounded corner element, and so they wanted to have some custom uh, select elements. Uh, and so the version on the right has the very top of the page, there's a little select element that has little rounded corners and it's custom styled. We wanted to make sure then, and it also, there was a JavaScript tool that actually updated the list based on a change in the select. What we said is if you don't have JavaScript, we don't want to make sure, we want to know people can still filter. So we built that on a native select element and if JavaScript's not available, we put in a button so that you can, you can make that action happen. It's a really simple change. But it, oh made a big difference in the way the accessibility worked. Uh, this again was a really, again, a simple example, but um, these sort of JavaScript enabled visual and animation tools are, are wonderful, but we wanna make sure that we don't prevent people from being able to submit a form. So we just used a radio set and then layered on the visual styles on top of it so everyone has access to it. Um, we've actually talked about some really more complex tools. This is obviously custom slider, and the custom slider is actually connected to another custom slider. It's a pretty uh, complex interaction, has nice visual feedback. Uh, we built this based on each of those sliders is just built on two select elements, and those select elements actually communicate to the JavaScript to, to manage those changes. So if you didn't have JavaScript available, this, uh, so sort of not just complex visuals, but complex interactions can be accomplished using progressive enhancement as your baseline. Uh, again, sort of, you can actually provide really nice feedback, conditional unlocking of features and things like that. 
Uh, but this is, a, this is an area where we just want to make sure that we're sensitive to everyone on the spectrum and let them all work with all of our tools. So we want to make sure that our core content, our words and images are all accessible. When we use essential functions, links and form elements, that they work based on some native capabilities. And then we enhance on top of that without blocking that you always build in accessibility features, make sure that ARIA roles are in place for any of the JavaScript tools so that you don't break any of the accessibility that native browser capabilities give people who have um, you need assistive technologies or have disabilities. And then we want to make sure that we have fallbacks. And this is a really crucial part where whenever we're talking about these, we require that our QA teams are in the design discussions. And our QA teams are working with us as we document and note. Because what we have the, there are not bugs. They're expected known variations to accommodate our range of users. And then that actually changes the way they approach testing. So we don't blindside them at the end of the conversation with a new way of testing. We've actually engaged them in the process from the start. Uh, again, we have a whole bunch of, a lot of those uh, little features that, that I just showed. We actually built plugins and we've tested them and we've built in all of the accessibility tools and you can grab them and use them if you like. So please feel free. Uh, and for anyone who really wants to geek out on it, we wrote a book, uh, 400 pages of designing with progressive enhancements. So uh, that's available for anyone who wants it. Um, but what we find is that progressive enhancement really liberates us to focus on great design opportunities. It's not at all a, a limitation. Uh, and that gets us to scale, which is where everybody usually starts in their discussion for responsive. What are our breakpoints? Let's start by determining our breakpoints. Um, and we find, again, that people typically come to us and say, okay, what breakpoints do you use? Expecting that there are some common patterns. 327, 68, 10, 24 is always what we come into the room with because everyone has an Apple device, and that's where they start with their mindset. And one of the things that from the beginning of our design perspective, we say, like, actually, for our first set of static designs, absolutely. Let's start with 320, 768, and 1024, because those are some common places on the spectrum. And we need a shared understanding of where we're going. So I know there were a lot of conversations about designing in code. We actually do still do uh, mock-ups. We use Illustrator because we like vector. So we actually still do pictures. And at 320, 768, and 1024, it's really nice to take a picture and put it on a device and see if it feels right. So we still do that. We'll actually come up, we come up with like principles for how our modular pieces all fit together based on those breakpoints. So we'll actually work in, in um, a static uh, medium for a while. But once you get to production, we kind of throw these away because 350 to 750 is really the most crowded and challenging and really neglected area. And that's where, like, if you want a, a site to work well, that's the space where you need to be thinking about how to optimize. But again, you want to come up for a grid system or, or something like that, that, it's just madness to try to figure out how to work every single place in that continuum. So what we've started to come up with is we want our layouts, our page layouts, to just have the simplest possible math. We want really easy principles for that. So we have, you know, we have, these feel like pretty diverse pages, but they're based on a really simple set of rules. We have a template that has two breakpoints. Goes from one column to a two column, and then to a bigger two column. Same thing here, we, we use single column up to 960 for some of those pages. This again, we had a set of templates, probably 80 templates that fell into, and they had like a fair amount of diversity, but they fell into four patterns for how we managed our, our um, to large page layout framework, and they only had two breakpoints. Pretty simple, just stacked modules. We would do a mix of, and for these cases, this is a site that is a little bit more functional and there are some components that need to have a little more control. And so we actually came up with a set of, temp, a set of breakpoints that had a mix of flexible and fixed size columns, and that actually became really useful to us because we had some pieces that we wanted to make sure had that sort of sense of micro control and others that didn't. Uh, so we wanted to keep that, we keep the sort of page level logic really simple. Maybe two, may, like if we, if we have more than two breakpoints, it's you're getting a little bit too overcomplicated. And then we focus our complexity in components. And that gives us a lot of an opportunity, more opportunity to micro optimize, to think about content layout, proximity, information density, and when to adjust and how to adjust, actually traditional design best practices really guide us all the way through. So this again, this is a fluid site. 
but it's not optimal responsive. Those two things are not necessarily equivalent. Conventional typography guidelines are really useful. So um, conventional type for optimized type, somewhere between 45 and 75 characters per line is a really comfortable uh, amount of content for people to read and scan and comprehend. So we let that be our guide. Uh, shorter columns, more compact columns, somewhere between 30 and 40 are great for quick scanning because they're, they're nice and isolated. If you do a more immersive uh, reading experience, the wider columns can be really, really useful. Uh, for interaction hit rates, there's a lot of great documentation about best practices for how much space someone needs to hit. Apple says 44 by 44 points is the amount of space and clearance you want for something that's touchable. Google says 50. They, Apple tested fingers. Google uses thumbs. You know, so they're all, uh, but theirs are, I think, are a good range. Um, and then we get to the point where for, for more complex data and functionality, we can actually focus on the component level and give it a little more love. So mastheads are always, I think, one of the more complex examples. And sometimes we'll have maybe four, six, eight. I think with the Boston Globe site, we actually had nine separate breakpoints for mastheads. And at each point in the process, you can really focus, if you're not worrying about the whole rest of the page, you can really focus on optimizing that piece of functionality to do its best purpose at each point in the continuum and you can make nice decisions about where you want to make those changes. And those changes will be small changes in type size, will actually change the order of things, will change like the space of scaling. Um, for things like data tables, this is, always, okay, this is always one where we want to make sure that information that's important to have close, like pieces of components that are important to have close to each other, or have some integrity to them. So focusing on these components at different sizes will let us understand where shifting from multi-column to let you scan up and down to a stack so that you know that the content for each individual object has some, some unity. So we have this sort of continuum where the, the right column is sort of supporting in secondary. We'll let it go to the bottom of the page because if people need it, they'll get there. But we want to make sure that the most important part of the content stays together and has some, has some logic to it. Um, sometimes we'll actually take really different approaches. So this, this is this, the exact same underlying markup for a calendar pattern. When we had space on the desktop, we know that people's paradigms of how calendars work fit with this model, big calendars. Once we got to tablets and phones, this, this representation was kind of overwhelming, so we shifted the focus to very just small. And this is actually a tool for someone, uh, for a restaurant management uh, tool where people manage their schedules. And so the schedule was delivered to them. So on the smaller devices, it was nice to be able to say, oh, am I on or off? The green means on, great. Once you get into the larger size, you actually have a lot more complexity and you can, you can manage a lot more functionality. Same basic markup, very different styles. Uh, sort of thinking about the different components, let us do that. Uh, and then once you actually think about, especially for more complex UIs, layering really becomes a really great tool. So you can prioritize and provide access to the most primary information in the page, layer secondary information on top. So uh, it's really common in a lot of e-commerce type sites where you have refining and filtering tools. We actually sort of, for this case, built a, case, built a, a rule where at desktop sizes where you could see it, it sits in the page. Once you get to smaller devices, it just, uh, we have a button that opens an overlay and it's the exact same component, same markup, really simple, just sitting in an overlay and it becomes familiar then. So if someone's switching from the desktop to their phone, the, the pieces have a sim similar visual integrity and so it's, they're not, there's not too much change and it's not as overwhelming. Uh, data tables are always a big challenge for responsive. Uh, we've actually worked on a couple of tools where, um, and we have a plugin actually, where we've actually built some tool where you can take an HTML table and actually use classes on each of the columns of data and it responsively checks the viewport width, figures out whether there's enough space and based on the priority system of those classes on the tables, it will hide secondary elements in an expandable space. Uh, again, it's, it's open source, it's called TableSaw, it's on our website and it's great. Uh, this is an example where it has a couple of features. This is actually an editable spreadsheet that was done with progressive enhancement, so it's completely editable on all, all devices. But one of the tools that we had here that was kind of cool is we gave this, the uh, plugin actually gives the user control where at smaller sizes, uh, any column that's hidden automatically shows a menu with a checkbox so the user can control which columns they see at a time. So that was, again, a nice sort of little bit of uh, uh, of enhancement that we just, we built a plugin to let, like, just let it happen automatically. 
and that actually worked really well. But this was a case where this is a, a work tool, so people need control, and, and building these tools actually uh, was helpful for us to sort of still support them in a responsive universe. Uh, and there are other cases, so we talk a lot about data density. Um, when you have large screens, seeing everything can be really helpful, but for smaller screens, you want to give people the information they need to make a first decision and then not overwhelm them with too much information. So we do do a lot of, uh, a lot of places where we will show and hide based on a viewport width to give people uh, an opportunity to focus on the first question they need to pay attention to and then move to secondary options. So for scale takeaways that we have sort of come to, like this is our, our standard operating procedure is that we want to start with simple page grids. We want to focus on breakpoints and components. Uh, use best practice typography and, and hit space sizes and things like that. Those are really well documented. And then think a lot about proximity and density and decision making in components because you want to help people, again, arrange the elements for the purpose that they need to accomplish. And we get to style. Um, and in some ways, style is the sort of the easiest of the, of the challenges. We've got our logo, color palettes, you know, distinctive shapes and textures and custom fonts. Uh, since like the dawn of marketing time, people have scaled their, their design systems to appropriate sizes and scales of things. We're just doing the same thing uh, in our responsive context, really thinking about the appropriate space. Uh, but one of the things that becomes really interesting though is when, whenever we talk about style issues, we're always, again, thinking about that pyramid and talking about them through the, the perspective of performance and access. So uh, custom fonts, I think, are a really interesting challenge for us. Uh, each, custom, each face of a custom font uh, can add anywhere between a quarter of a second on some network speeds to two seconds per cut. So bold, italic, Roman, each one is a separate file. So when we're looking at, at custom fonts, we actually start with that question of, is it worth two to four seconds, six seconds? Is it worth 10 seconds of, time, of page load time to get three custom fonts in? Or can we choose just one that makes things distinctive or two? So we want to be as judicious about that as we possibly can. Um, for uh, very specific custom presentation styles, things like rounded corners and gradients, we really try to rely on CSS as much as possible because it's really lightweight. And what we know is that all CSS properties are not supported on all browsers. So we'll have a frank discussion at the beginning. You know, IE8 uh, and, and earlier doesn't support most of the more modern CSS um, uh, presentation styles. So we'll look at a page that uses CSS only and have a, a, a conversation to say, you know, if you need rounded corners or you need gradients, is it okay, like do you wanna add images in JavaScript and again, add like two to 10 seconds for everyone's experience so IE8 people will see that? Or are we okay with things being square and flat? Like can we just have a compromise and then this is again something that the QA team is in the room. We have that conversation. We all agree that the best experience for everyone includes an experience where you know, IE8 will have a slightly visually degraded moment, but that, that's a performance opportunity that we're gonna take advantage of. Uh, and then there are a couple of visual uh, issues that uh, as we've looked at sort of all of the different devices and browsers that we find it, that have some really interesting challenges and so we just wanna educate our clients about them. Icon fonts, fixed positioning, custom form elements, and animations uh, are really challenging. So um, icon fonts uh, are wonderful, they're scalable, you can recolor them, but they're not always supported everywhere and when they don't work, the, the, the browser or the device will just find a fallback and fill it in. So this is a case, I don't know if like, that was a table data that had some guy icon fonts, the, the device couldn't find it, I think it was an Android device, couldn't find it, it put a pair of skis and, and a peace sign in place. Um, I don't know how many of you have used Etsy. Etsy had a rating system and they found that they had a font in, in their bug so that they had a starring system and iOS could not find the half star and replaced it with a horse. So that was for two days, the rating system on Etsy. Uh, and it's like foreign horse stars has become a really interesting uh, measure. And so uh, one of the things that we have done is we've, we rely on SVGs. Uh, if, you really, if, it, if your icons or your illustrations are critical to people understanding your content, SVGs are somewhat more reliable. They don't work on all browsers, but you can set up a ping fallback so you get an image. And so that actually works for us. And uh, again, we built a tool called GruntCon that will automate the ping fallback. So you can just put in SVGs, it will generate SVGs and create uh, data URIs. So it will swap them out. So 
for anyone who wants to use SVGs in that way. Again, there are some devices that, like a Chrome for a while, just wasn't supporting emoji at all. So you get little bl little black squares, or whatever that little icon is over there on the right. Um, we've had a lot of, of clients that really want to think about fixed positioning because they want important elements to be in people's uh, visual space. The problem is sometimes they're in your visual space in a way that you didn't intend or expect. Um, we try to use that very, very sparingly. Uh, and to talk a lot about why you would want to do it, um, because it can, it's not always supported everywhere and not well. Um, this is an exercise that we did uh, for uh, custom styling on select menu on every, dev every device and browser, uh, just to talk about what it means. So this is, again, a tool that we presented to, uh, to QA teams to just say, if we use CSS for styling and style native elements, sometimes that styling won't come through or it won't come through perfectly, but is that okay? Are we all right with a 95% accurate styling and then some awkward places or some places where a user will see a native element which will feel normal to them? Is that a good compromise? And so this is a tool that we just sort of have in our back pocket to talk about how we make decisions and what those compromises are. And then uh, we've, we have spent a lot of time working on um, sites that have animations. And uh, one of the things that we've discovered is that on certain and Android um, platforms and, and operating systems, animations are very, very, very laggy. On Android 2, 3, and 4, 0, even standard animations can take up to four seconds to load. So this is a place where an emulator won't tell you that. And so having a real device with a couple of different operating systems can be very enlightening. And so uh, we try to make sure that our animations, uh, we actually do a feature test to make sure that um, Animation, certain animation frame principles are available and only deliver animations then. And for everyone else, we do a simple transition just because immediacy is more important than slides and fades for most of the features that we're talking about. Uh, and then social widgets are heavy everywhere. So what we just like to do is we know they're important, people need them, uh, but we like to make sure that they don't block at least first page render, lazy load them, and make sure that, they, that you give the rest of the page time. Uh, and so in all of those cases, we start by saying like, is it really necessary? Again, for everyone. Um, if you do want to use it, you want to make sure that you confirm the capabilities and then you apply carefully. Sometimes you can apply it only with a feature test, only to devices that you know that can support it. Uh, you want to make sure you provide fallbacks. And then again, testing on real devices is invaluable in that case. And finally, um, for approvals and QA, style guide, reference, everything. Code is the documentation. Code is the style guide. Once you get beyond design, uh, code, is, code becomes the record of our design systems always. Uh, and there were a lot of questions yesterday in Adrian and Florence uh, discussion about how that works. So we do just enough design in wireframes or Photoshop or, or Illustrator to get the principles of how things work. And then we move to code as quickly as possible. We abandon grids, we abandon specs, we create uh, an online style guide. Because, and what we end up doing always is we come up with a static version of all of our templates that we keep as the visual style guide. And we coordinate with our, development, our client development teams so that they actually will agree on, on the standard markup patterns and then the design teams own the CSS. And they actually have a front end developer on their team who actually manages the CSS and coordinates with the back end team. So if you're using a platform that has specific markup requirements, those are the starting point for the visual design team. And the CSS is always owned by the designers and owned by the brand team. So that's a little bit of a di different division of labor, but we find that it works really well. So those are sort of the, the rules that we've come up with. The, the question for responsive is always make it fast and then make sure it functions. We use simple grids and complex components. We think about scale and style in ways that are standard visual design styles, and then our code becomes our documentation. And so we want to start and end with a, an understanding that consistent doesn't mean identical. Consistent means appropriate experiences for each device and, and each person. So, and I went over my time, and I apologize, but that's how, <laughs> that's how we work. Thanks, Betty. Sure. Sorry, Dan. No, you were, you were perfect. No time for questions? Maybe time for questions? So we, uh, we, we have time for like one question before there's time to switch rooms. No, we yeah. started three, three minutes late yeah. uh, just to give t people time to, to come in. So um, who's going who's gonna to be the question? And I then uh, Patty will be around at lunch. Oh, yeah, I'll definitely be around all yes. day.
Come on, everyone's still sleeping, really. They're, um, no, they're just taking it in. Yes, sir. So the question is, are the pattern guides custom or do you rely on frameworks? Uh, that depends on the client. We have had some, uh, some clients who want to use Bootstrap and they've started with a, a standard set of Bootstrap uh, patterns. We have other clients who have a Dojo framework and they want to make sure that they build things on uh, you know, Dojo widgets. Uh, so we will always start from a beginning understanding of whatever the sort of existing technology and stack infrastructure uh, is you know, best optimized for and then we'll build from there. Um, most of the time we'll actually uh, build sort of, we'll write uh, custom HTML, custom CSS. Uh, and what we found when we've looked at frameworks is a lot of them have a lot more features than you will necessarily need. And so we'll try to start with the simplest possible version. Like even we have actually started with, um, we have a custom uh, small, really super vanilla JavaScript framework that uses the same APIs as jQuery. So we can start with a lighter version of jQuery. jQuery is whatever, 35K. Uh, our, it's just called shoestring and it's five. So it has just a very small number of features and you can build on it. But if you decide that you outgrow it, you can use jQuery and it will have all of the same APIs. Well, we always try to start with the simplest version and usually that means starting from scratch. Fantastic. I think uh, uh, if, if more of the web was built the way that you guys approach things, we'd be in a really good place. So uh, hopefully all you all were paying attention and you're inspired by it. Thanks again, Patty. Yeah, and honestly, Big round of applause for uh, Patty Tolan. Thanks.